So you're interested in commercial real estate. See, you're going to love this video because I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step guide on exactly the steps that you need. I'm going to go through the good, the bad, the ugly, and the seven steps that you need to get started doing commercial real estate deals right now. So let's get started. And after I share these seven steps, I'm going to share with you a bonus resource that will kind of pull this all together so that you can go out and start making offers on deals right away. So hang out to the end so you can get a chance at getting that amazing resource. And let's get started with step number one. So step number one is you need to learn the basics of commercial real estate. The fundamentals of commercial real estate is crucial so that when you're talking to things like uh, brokers, title agents, property managers, contractors, that you come across like someone who knows something about what you're doing. You're not a complete jack leg. Like you don't wanna come off of the greenhorn. So if you understand the basics, it really catches you up to everybody else in the marketplace. Some key concepts to learn include the different types of commercial properties, and we'll cover all that later. Well, we're gonna talk about some common terminology like letter of intent, earnest money deposit, due diligence, you know, what an estoppel letter is and the basic financial metrics like NOI and cap rate, which we'll cover on a step below. So just really high level, a letter of intent is a non-binding letter that says, I intend to buy these property with this general terms, like purchase price. I'm going to do seller financing. I'm going to do all cash. I'm going to do whatever the LOI says is a shortcut way of communicating to the seller your interest in buying the property. That's referred to as an LOI and it's used in commercial real estate a lot. Earnest money deposit, very common used in any kind of real estate. It's just like your interest in the property. I'm going to put down a 1% or $5,000 or whatever you know, amount of money you guys negotiate. And it's like your way of saying to the seller, I'm serious about buying this property. And due diligence, obviously you want to get the property under contract. And after the property's under contract, then you figure out what it is the property's actually performing at. And you do your inspections. This is called a due diligence period to see if what the seller has been telling you in their listing or in their disclosures is actually accurate or there are any, any surprises. Those are just some real basic concepts. And I find that the best place to get started with that is, is a book, Commercial real estate for dummies. Peter Conti is the author. He's actually my mentor and business partner here at Real Estate 101. So it's a great place to go and learn a bunch about real estate really quickly to get the basic level foundation up to a good level. Okay, step number two is to choose your asset class. And let's talk about what that means. There are five different types of asset classes in commercial real estate, multifamily, office, retail, industrial, and hospitality. Each of them comes with their own pros and cons. For instance, multifamily properties can provide very steady, reliable income, but they tend to have a little bit of higher turnover rates. People are come moving in and out of an apartment much faster than they are, say, an uh, industrial property. Industrial properties might offer longer term leases, but they can be a lot more challenging to manage because they're just more complicated than a multifamily lease, which is usually a year long. And so retail and office are also asset classes that lately have been heavily impacted by the work from home trend that's been going on where people just don't live or are working in offices in the same way they used to a few years ago. And then e-commerce, of course, has crushed the retail market. So I would not recommend getting into those asset classes unless you know exactly what you're doing. If you have some sort of insight, then there are still ways to make money in those asset classes. But if you're new to this and you're just trying to get started, I probably wouldn't recommend starting there. We basically recommend people starting with an asset class that they basically inherently understand. And we find that most people understand housing, apartment complexes, mobile home parks, RV parks. These are things that really aren't that complicated. These are very simple businesses that are rather intuitive to most anyone because, you know, like everyone's lived in a house. Everybody lives in an apartment or a mobile home. We, we've all lived someplace before. So we already know what people like in a place to live. So there's a lot less to learn. But you may find some inside knowledge about storage facilities because that's something your family's been into or maybe you've worked for an industrial company before and you've I don't know, run tire shop or something and you have an insight there because you have you know specific knowledge about that industry already so basically what we're saying is start with what you already know best and we find that most people by default just understand how where people live the best step number three is to choose your market so by choosing your market, you are selecting the right market. And that's just a fundamental key thing because you want to buy into a market that has a growing population, has a, a strong market with new jobs being added all the time. And it has a diverse employer base. We want to own properties where people actually live and people want to live and do business. This is a rising tide that helps your property perform the best. And so the more economic activity in the market, the better luck that you're going to have owning an asset in that city or market that is 
is doing well, is growing. We like to really tell people to avoid sparsely populated areas, rural areas, unless you really know what you're doing, be careful there. And also avoid high crime areas. There's a chance that you can make money in those markets. There's somebody's making money in real estate somewhere, sometime, uh, all the time. But why make it hard for yourself? Pick a market that in a scenario where it's easy. We use resources like primegrade.org to find out what the prime rate is by zip code. We use things like Neighborhood Scout to figure out what's happening with the demographics in a given area. And there's a sorted variety of things on the internet that you can use with a little bit of a Google searching to find data about a given market. Most of the stuff is free, easily accessible. All right, moving on to step number four, which is to choose your investment strategy. There are three basic types of strategies that we would say new people would start with. Uh, the first one is wholesaling. The second one might be value add and sell. And the third is buy and hold. Each of them has the pros and cons. We're not telling you which one's better. You want to do what makes sense for you. So real quickly, wholesaling involves finding a property at a deep discount and then doing, you're never taking title of the property. You're just getting a contract and you turn around and sell it quickly. So you need to find properties at really deep discounts. You basically, you're negotiating a great price or great terms, and then you sell your interest in the contract to a third party buyer for a fee. And you can make some pretty nice fees in the commercial wholesaling space. You can earn a year's salary with a good wholesale fee with a commercial deal. So it's a great strategy if you don't already have a lot of cash to begin with. You use your time and hustle and energy to go and earn some cash because you don't have the cash to buy the property yet. So it's a great way to get started doing that. And the next one strategy we're going to talk about is the value add and sell strategy. And this is where you find a property that has some sort of physical or financial or management distress. And it's all about improving the property and increasing its value by taking over the management. Maybe it's somebody was older, they didn't have good management that's in place, or the property has been run down, they didn't manage it well, and they didn't you know, make improvements, so they can't rent it for the highest amount. And so basically, you're going to improve the operation of the business. This is the value add. You're trying to create value by running things better. Then after you've stabilized the property, you sell that property several years later at a premium. It's like creating a turnkey business for a bigger buyer who doesn't want to do all the work. They have cash and they just want to come in and buy the property that's already been stabilized. So your whole period in these kind of situations is something like three to seven years. So it's not like flipping houses when you're flipping apartments or flipping commercial properties. The whole time is usually one, two, three, as far as five or seven years. It's very common for between that three and seven year time period is when you would then sell a property. That's the value add and sell strategy. So the next strategy is pretty similar to that, but it's the buy and hold strategy. And this is where you intend hold the property for the duration. You're not going into it thinking that you're going to flip it and make a big payout in three to seven years. You're buying for cash flow, a long-term cash flow, and you'll build quite a bit of wealth, but it'll be in equity in the property over time. And you may sell it 20 years down the road, but that's not your intention. When you buy it, it's like, when do I want to sell? You're just like, I just want to have a business that creates cash flow for me. That's the buy and hold strategy. And each strategy has its good things and its bad things. It has its risk and its pros and cons. So choose the one that aligns with your current goals and those goals may change as you develop as an investor and that's okay so you may start off wholesaling you might start flipping properties for three five seven years and then ten years into your commercial real estate business then you might start buying and holding and it's a very common trajectory that we see with commercial investors all right step number five learn how to underwrite or run the numbers on your commercial real estate investments underwriting involves analyzing the financial aspects of the property and then determine its value and what the potential returns for the property could be and this is looking at the financial doing some market analysis and understanding the risk of the property. How likely are the rents going to be what they say they are, that kind of thing. A lot of people get pretty overwhelmed by running the numbers, but you really can boil this business down into just, I am going to buy a stream of income. Commercial real estate is simply a small business that you're buying that has a stream of income. Turns out it's a very simple business to understand. Basically, you take the revenue from the rents and then you subtract the operating expenses of the property and then you now have your net operating income and your NOI is usually an annualized number. And so you take the revenue for the year, you take the operating expenses for the year, and that turns into your net operating income. And you divide that number by the purchase price of a rental property. And that is your cap rate, which is short for capitalization rate. So if you buy a property for all cash, your cap rate is your return on investment. So if you buy a seven cap, you'll hear people prefer is like, oh, it's trading for a five cap. Oh, over there, 
there, it's an eight cap. Over there, you know, in LA, it's a two cap. Two cap is like a 2% return on your money, very low. A 12 cap is a 12% return on your money, which is very high. So, and obviously you want a property that has a return on investment as high as you can possibly get it. The good news about real estate is you can borrow most of the money to buy the property. So once you get the loan terms from the lender, you then calculate what your monthly payments are so you can figure out if you can afford to pay the mortgage. This is often referred to as the debt service. You take the monthly operating income, so revenue minus expenses for the year, you get your operating income, divide that by 12 to get your monthly number, and then subtract out your mortgage payment. Now you have your free cash flow available to you per month. And the annual cash flow divided by your down payment ends up being your cash on cash return. And we like to target a cash on cash return for an you know, annualized term in the range of 10 to 15 percent and it's really that simple that's all you have to do when you're running the numbers it's a very simple business the hardest part of the math here is calculating your mortgage payment which you can find by going to an online mortgage calculator very easily okay let's move on to step number six which is building your local network now that you know the basics of running the numbers you're gonna need to talk to some people and you need to build the relationships that you need to actually operate this business and find deals and it's the next step after you understand and run the numbers but it's also probably the hardest step the, the one that people don't think about is going and finding your relationships and your network in a good market is kind of a stressor for and we can't really overemphasize how important it is for you to pick a market and work on developing those relationships in that local market it's a very common mistake for new investors to underestimate how much work it takes to develop a strong network of people and so we'll see investors they'll go all over the place they'll be in four or five different states you know looking at deals and they don't know anybody in these states and that's not at all what we recommend it takes a lot of time to learn a new market it takes time to establish your network of people that actually know who you are we pick up the phone and call and this is just a business of relationships so many deals happen in commercial real estate via word of mouth and there's a lot of referrals that happen from professionals that you get to know by working in a local market and so the key people that you want to meet in any given market are your broker uh, you want to find a property manager because you're not going to do this yourself you want to find a lender you may you probably gonna find multiple lenders you're gonna find a title company you want to work with and maybe an attorney, you're definitely going to want some professional contractors who work on the type of asset class that you're working on. Oftentimes that referral comes from your property manager. So you meet these folks by attending local meetups, join professional organizations, actively making calls to potential sellers. And when you chat up these potential sellers, you give them a call, you use commercialdealfinder.com as a way to filter for potential off-market leads. You do a skip trace so that you get their number and you call them up and say, hey, I'm looking to buy a property in the area. And you get to know somebody in the market and you can ask them when you're talking to them, hey, you know, who, who is it that you use for your property manager? What do you think of? And so now you have a number of a property manager. You can call. Meeting people really isn't that hard. You just have to do the work. You got to put in the phone calls, you got to put in the effort and take some notes. So with all the people you've talked to. All right, last step, step seven, analyzing deals. We like to tell people that you need to be making, analyzing a deal every day and making at least one written offer per week. And we suggest getting to a place where this is just what you do every single week because it really does turn into a numbers game. Regular practice improves your skills and your competence and your comfortability with talking to people. It also increases your chance of actually finding a deal. The more people you talk to, the better chance you get something to happen. An offer doesn't count unless it is in writing. You call somebody up and make a verbal offer. We don't give that credit for, yeah, you've talked to somebody, but you want to write it down, make the effort, write it down, email it to them. Many people get super nervous about making that commitment of putting it on paper and either mailing it or emailing it to the broker or to the seller. And that's what this business is about. Somebody remember that bonus I was gonna talk about? Well, I think I know what you're wondering after you're listening to these seven steps. So that's great. These steps are very helpful, but how do I actually make an offer? Like what paperwork should I use? Well, I got you covered. I have our contract linked in the video description below. It explains how to fill out the contract so you can start making offers like right away. As soon as you download this, you have all the paperwork you need and we're basically removing all the obstacles so you can get your first deal and have that deal completely change your life. So if you found this video helpful, you can make sure and join our Facebook group, which is also linked in the description below. We have lots of tips and communities. We do challenges in there. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment on what step that you're having the most trouble with right now, because I'll personally answer you and give you some sort of tip to help you get over the obstacle. Make sure and check out this next video, which will be coming up right about here. The YouTube algorithm has gone through its magic and decided this is the best thing for you to watch right now.